Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ina Paricio. I am a marketing manager here at EDB and I will be your host today for our webinar, EDB Postgres Advanced Server 14 Highlights. I'm joined today by Robert Haas, VP and Chief Database Scientist at EDB. Before I turn it over to him, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, number one, this presentation is being recorded. So we will be sharing the slides and the recording afterwards. Second, the lines are currently muted. If you have any questions or comments, drop it in the Q&A panel that it's right below um, in your screen. And uh, with that said, I will hand it over to Robert to kick us off. All right, thank you, Ina. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you about uh, some of the highlights of Advanced Server 14. Uh, which is our upcoming release. And uh, those highlights are really going to be divided up into uh, three categories. Ina, can you confirm that you can see my slides all right? Yep, all good, Robert. Okay, great. So uh, first I'd like to tell you about some of the features that were developed specifically for inclusion in Advanced Server 14. Um, and then I'd like to tell you about how Advanced Server 14 is going to feature full support for EDB's Postgres BDR product. And finally, I'd like to tell you about a few of the highlights of PostgreSQL 14, since all of the PostgreSQL 14 features and changes are also uh, included in Advanced Server 14 in accord with our usual uh, practice here at EDB. So we'll start with the features that were developed specifically for uh, Advanced Server 14, and I've got five categories to go through. Uh, first of all, we have uh, a number of auditing improvements, and the highlight of that is object level auditing. Um, then I'm going to be telling you about some uh, new functionality related to object creation and last DDL time, some improvements to our support for connect by, uh, some enhancements to subpartitioning, and finally, some usability enhancements uh, for the PSQL command line tool, which many people, uh, including me, use to access uh, the database all the time. So we'll begin with object level, object level auditing. Uh, Advanced Server has for a long time now had an audit log, which is uh, separate from the uh, regular server log. And you can decide which kinds of things you'd like to have written to the audit log by setting various configuration parameters. Uh, so for example, here, uh, I've shown an example on the top of the slide where I set login collector equal to on. Uh, which is necessary in order to enable this feature. And then I set EDB audit log to XML uh, to specify the format in which I would like things to be written to the audit log. I could also choose CSV. Um, and then I set EDB audit statement to insert, comma, update, comma, delete, which says that I would like all insert, update, and delete statements to be written to the audit log. Now, what you can't do in existing releases of advanced server is make whether or not a particular statement is written to the audit log depend on which objects are affected by that statement. Uh, in Advanced Server 14, you can do this. So if you look at the example that I have on the bottom half of the slide, uh, you can do something like alter table receivables set EDB audit group equal to finance. And then you can use that EDB audit group name finance in the value that you configure for the EDB audit statement configuration variable. So I can say something like insert at finance, update at finance, and delete at finance. And that means that only the insert, update, and delete statements that target tables which are in the finance group will be written to the audit log. The benefit of this is it helps you keep your audit log volume low. Uh, many of our customers use audit logging as a way of meeting compliance requirements. And if they only need to audit certain operations, they can sometimes with existing releases end up having to basically audit log all of their statements in order to meet their requirements. And that can be uh, burdensome if they have a very busy database because the amount of stuff that gets written to the audit log can end up being very large. With this improvement, it should be more possible to get just the things that you need into the audit log without uh, being burdened with uh, uh, logging statements that you don't really need to keep track of. You have the option to exclude specific tables rather than including specific tables. And I've shown an example of that here. I have a table called sock drawer, which needless to say, is not really worth auditing. 
So I have put it into an EDB audit group called boring. Then I set the EDB audit statement configuration variable to insert minus boring update minus boring and delete minus boring. And the sense of that operator is that uh, we're going to log everything except for tables which are in that particular EDB audit group. The inclusion and exclusion operators can be used together. So for example, I could say insert at finance update minus boring, and then I would be logging insert statements on all tables that are in the finance group and update statements on all tables that are not in the boring group. Since Advanced Server 10, we've actually had the ability to customize auditing rules by user and by database. So for example, if I have a user that I don't fully trust, in this case, I've used the username Sketchy, I can set the EDB audit statement configuration variable to the special value all just for that user. And then every single statement by user Sketchy will be written to the audit log. Other users will use whatever setting is there on a system-wide basis, but that particular user uh, is subject to a heightened requirement. Similarly, I could alter the EDB audit statement just for the database sensitive. And again, I could choose to log everything that occurs in that database, regardless of what I'm logging in general. This flexibility to set different rules for different users or databases can be combined with the new per object auditing syntax. So for example, I could choose on a system-wide basis to log all select insert, update, and delete operations to tables in the finance group. But then if you look at this example uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see that for the CFO user, I've set EDB audit statement to only log delete operations uh, on tables in the finance group and not uh, the other types of operations. So the CFO will be free to select, insert, and update uh, those tables without any auditing. But if that user deletes from those tables, that will still be audited. In addition to per object auditing, we ha now have a new feature for in database audit log rotation. In existing releases of advanced server, audit log rotation needs to be handled outside the server, commonly using uh, something like log rotate or perhaps a custom script that is run out of cron. Uh, some of our customers found that inconvenient and they asked for a facility that was part of the database, which we have now added. To enable this feature, you set EDB audit archiver to on. And then there are a variety of different configuration variables which you can set uh, in order to customize the behavior. Um, in this example here, I've set audit logs to be compressed after one day and to be expired uh, after seven days. By default, compressing the files will uh, apply gzip to them and removing the files will apply rm to them. But you can customize those commands. Uh, and for example, expiring the file could move it to some other storage location rather than simply removing it. You can also rotate logs based on size rather than by time. There is uh, a new feature also for tracking object creation times and last DDL times. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, I created a brand new database using uh, our beta version of advanced server 14. And I created a table called foo. And then I queried the all objects view to find out when foo was created and when DDL on it was last performed. And as you can see, it's easy to tell that this object has not been altered since its creation. If I had multiple objects called foo, uh, or if I didn't know what type of object foo was, I didn't know whether it was a table or a function or a schema, I would probably want to include some more of the columns of the all objects view uh, in the output here, or maybe uh, include more of those columns in the where clause. But in this case, uh, I was just using a, uh, a test database with only one interesting object in it. So I could make the query very simple just to give you the point of how this works. I think the value of this is that sometimes people have situations where something stops working in the database and they don't really know why. Maybe some other database user has made changes to the definition of some object and those, uh, those uh, changes are not uh, immediately known to the person who's trying to troubleshoot the problem. With this kind of capability, it's easy to find out whether any objects have been recently modified. Um, it does apply to objects of every type. It applies to tables, functions, schemas, procedures, uh, everything that you can create using a create command or alter using an alter command. 
Let me now talk about full support for ConnectFi. We have long had support for the ConnectFi syntax in advanced server. And uh, in order to make that support work, you needed to have queries of a certain very specific, very specific form. You had to either have something like connect by x equals prior y, or alternatively, something of the form connect by prior x equals y. The operator that you used did not necessarily have to be the equals operator, uh, and the variable names did not have to be x and y, or the column names did not have to be x and y. In fact, in addition to using a different column name, you could even use a general expression, provided that you put it inside parentheses. But something like connect by level is less than or equal to 10, which is a very common idiom, did not work because 10 is an integer, not a variable name, um, and because prior does not appear on either side. Similarly, something like connect by x equals prior y and z equals t would not work because the full expression had to be exactly column equals prior other column and not with some additional clause attached at the end. But those examples will now work. Prior is now also supported in the, in the target list for a connect by queries. So you can write queries like the one that I've shown here. This imagines a tree of employees with the CEO at the top having no manager. And then after that, uh, traversing the links from that CEO down to the CEO's direct reports and then level by level until the entire organization is reached. As you can see, uh, I have got prior ename as manager in the target list for this query. And that's going to find the name of each uh, employee's manager since we're traversing the tree from top to bottom, starting with the CEO. We have a couple of improvements uh, in the area of subpartitioning. Uh, in this example here, I've created uh, a table called example with two partitions, P1 and P2. Each of those partitions will be automatically given two subpartitions, S1 and S2. Furthermore, if I add additional partitions to this table in the future, each one of those new partitions will also get two subpartitions, S1 and S2. This behavior is, uh, to the best of our ability, to make it so compatible with Oracle. You can also now use uh, the syntax shown in the second example on the slide to query a subpartition. One of the differences between Oracle's implementation of partitioning and PostgreSQL's implementation of partitioning is that PostgreSQL considers each partition or subpartition to be a table in its own right. Uh, in Oracle, that's not the case. So Oracle users who want to access a partition or subpartition directly may be used to using syntax similar to what I've shown here. And that syntax will now also work in Advanced Server 14. Finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, how we've improved the usability of the PSQL command line tool. PostgreSQL offers a facility where you can type backslash H and the name of a command into the PSQL prompt and get a syntax summary for that command. In previous releases of Advanced Server, this would only work for commands that exist in PostgreSQL and not for commands that have been added in Advanced Server. In this release, we've rectified that problem. Uh, and so you can now do something like what I've shown here, type a command like backslash H create package and get a summary of the syntax for that command. We've also added tab completion support for all of the EDB specific commands. That makes it much easier to write queries in PSQL and not have to refer to the documentation in order to get things to work as you're hoping that they will. Before I move on, I'd like to address one of the questions which came up in the Q&A. Someone asked whether there's an order of precedence uh, in terms of auditing regarding uh, groups and users. Groups actually don't affect the auditing configuration at all. What affects the auditing configuration is the individual users. I think that the intended question might be about users versus databases. Um, I don't remember whether alter user takes precedence over alter database or the other way around, but in case the precedence is not what you want, there's also an alter user in database construct which could be used to patch up the problem there. Next, I'd like to move on to talking about how Advanced Server 14 will offer full support for Postgres BDR. Postgres BDR is EDB's bidirectional replication product, and it allows for multi-master logical replication with advanced conflict resolution. 
One of the really great things about Postgres BDR is that it's a server extension. That means it can be used with a variety of different database servers. It can be used with PostgreSQL version 11 or higher. It can be used with advanced server version 11 or higher. And it can be also be used with EDB Postgres Extended, formerly known as Second Cube Postgres. As a server extension, Postgres BDR cannot do arbitrary changes to the server behavior. It's a loadable module, and it has to work within the extensibility interfaces provided by PostgreSQL. However, there are certain really nice features that can only be unlocked with deeper server changes. Those additional server changes are included in all versions of EDB Postgres Extended, and they're also now included in Advanced Server 14. This is not a BDR presentation, so it's beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about here today and beyond my knowledge to give you a full overview of all of the things that BDR can do. But I do want to briefly review the additional BDR functionality that will be unlocked by the addition of these server capabilities to Advanced Server 14. There are a total of five features. The first one is called commit it most once. One of the general problems that people have with using databases is that things can get very confusing if you send a commit command to the database and then lose the database connection before getting a response. It's impossible to know what really happened in general. It might be that the commit command never even reached the database, or it might be that the commit command reached the database but could not be processed for some reason, or it's possible that the commit command reached the database, was processed, and the response didn't get back to you. Therefore, you don't intrinsically have a way of knowing whether or not the changes that were part of that transaction are actually going to be reflected in the database. This feature aims to address that problem. With this feature, your application can find out whether your previous transaction was successfully committed or not. And this works even if your new database connection is to a different node within the cluster than your previous connection. The second feature is called eager replication. This is an optional feature to avoid replication conflicts. When this feature is enabled, every transaction is applied on all nodes simultaneously, and the source transaction only commits if no replication conflicts are detected. Using this feature does reduce performance, but it provides extremely strong consistency guarantees and there may, therefore may be uh, really uh, well adapted to situations where you have very high value transactions and you need to be absolutely certain uh, that they're going to happen in a consistent way on every node in your cluster. The third feature is the ability to hold back freezing. BDR tries to ensure in general that transactions which touch the same data are committed in the same order on every replica as they were on the origin nodes. However, if vacuum freezes the rows uh, before replication has been completed, then it's possible that commit timestamp data could be lost. And that could lead to the replication not happening in the same order on the replica node as it did on the origin node. There are ways around this problem through manual tuning if it is something that affects you in your environment, but this infrastructure avoids that problem with less effort on the part of the user. The fourth feature is the single decoding worker. The logical replication facilities that are part of PostgreSQL work best for relatively small clusters. If you have a single publisher and multiple subscribers, the data in the right ahead log stream will deco be decoded once for each subscriber. That's not usually a problem if you have two or three replicas, but in large clusters with say 20 or 30 or 50 replicas, the CPU and memory consumption required to repeatedly decode the write ahead log can be an issue. What this feature allows you to do is have the write ahead log decoded just once and then have the results of the decoding process be shipped to every subscriber independently. This can really help performance if you have a large cluster. The fifth and final feature is timestamp based snapshots. What this does is provide a globally consistent view of the database cluster as it existed at some moment in time, either right now or in the recent past. The snapshot that you get will include all of the transactions that committed on any node prior to the timestamp that you choose and nothing that committed afterwards. There are plans to build additional functionality on top of this basic feature, but in the meantime, you can use this basic feature uh, in your applications as you wish. That's all I have to say about Postgres BDR integration. So now I'm going to uh, move on to talking about some of the new features of PostgreSQL 14. 
uh, as I said before, Advanced Server 14 uh, is based on PostgreSQL 14. And that's true of every release of Advanced Server. It's based on the corresponding release of PostgreSQL. Therefore, whatever features are present in the PostgreSQL release are also present in the Advanced Server release. And that feature list is quite long. It represents not only the results of community contributors who are employed by EDB, but in fact, the combined efforts of the whole PostgreSQL community, uh, which is a large community with many active developers. It would be impossible to go through the complete feature list in any reasonable amount of time. There are thousands of changes in every release and hundreds of documented features. So in this presentation, I'm just going to go over a few of the features that I'm most excited about in PostgreSQL 14. Uh, which will also be available in Advanced Server 14, uh, and which I think will be of particular interest to Advanced Server customers. First of all, I'd like to cover four developer features. One of the coolest things that's coming in this release is subscripting for the JSON data type. If you have a JSON object and you want to extract part of that object, you can do that in all recent releases, but you need to use functional notation. In Advanced Server 14 and PostgreSQL 14, you can instead use a much more natural subscripting notation. In the example on the slide, I have a JSON object with a single key, Postgres. The corresponding value uh, is another object with a single key called release, whose value is 14. I can simply subscript that object and ask for the Postgres key and the release key, and 14 pops right out. That makes the syntax quite a, for this sort of thing quite a bit more compact than it was previously. The second uh, developer feature that I'd like to highlight is multi-ranges. PostgreSQL has supported range types since version 9.2. PostgreSQL 14 adds multi-ranges, which can store multiple ranges in a single value. For example, something like a range where uh, we include all values greater than or equal to three and less than seven, or a range where we include all values greater than or equal to eight and less than nine could be stored individually in a range type. But as you can see from the example on the slide, we can store both ranges together in a single multi-range. Multi-ranges have the same sort of operators that are available for range types, like union and intersection. So you can use them to compute on any data type where you find that to be a useful thing to do. Uh, dates and times are a popular choice. The third developer feature that I'd like to highlight is alter table detach partition concurrently. Uh, I think this is going to be really useful for people who are making use of range partitioning in a way where they periodically need to remove old data. Uh, it's often the case that you, know, you may partition by month or by serial number, but eventually old months or old serial numbers become uninteresting. In previous releases, you could get rid of those old partitions either by dropping them or by detaching them and then dropping them after they are detached. But either way, you would have to at least briefly uh, block out query access to the table in order to accomplish that operation. This feature allows you to avoid that. When you detach a partition concurrently, uh, selects, inserts, updates, and deletes on the partition table are able to proceed without any interference. Once the detach concurrently operation uh, has been completed, you can drop the detached partition uh, whenever you'd like. The last developer feature I'd like to highlight is libpq pipelining. If you use libpq to connect to the database, and that's the C connector for PostgreSQL, uh, then you can modify your application to send several queries at once with this new feature. This might be really helpful if you have something like a web application that queries the database, runs a bunch of really short queries, and then uses the results to generate HTML. Since it's something where the user is waiting for the rendering process to complete, it's very sensitive to latency. And you may know what all of the queries that you want to send are uh, right at the beginning before you've sent any of them. In previous releases and with the standard interfaces, you would need to send the query, wait to get the result back, and only then send the next query. And when you got the response back to the second query, you could then send the third query and so forth and so on. That works fine for long running queries or when performance isn't a huge issue, but when you have a lot of short running queries that are very tightly packed together, the server can spend a reasonable percentage of its time waiting for the next query to arrive. With this pipelining feature, you can just queue up a whole bunch of queries and the database 
server will process them one after the next, sending the results of each one of those queries to the client as soon as it has it and immediately begin working on the next query. Uh, there's a question here about how the JSONB subscript works. Uh, it returns uh, type JSONB. In PostgreSQL, the return type of a function or operator can't be uh, dependent on anything uh, on what it finds in the data. So if the return type were something like text, that would only work uh, when the result was text. Or if the return type were integer, that would only work when the result type happened to be an integer. But the return type of the function has to be declared, and it has to always be the same for every invocation of the function. So JSONB is the practical alternative there. Um, in terms of performance improvements, uh, there are four performance improvements that I'd like to highlight. The first one is in the area of snapshot scalability. PostgreSQL, like quite a number of other databases, uh, supports MVCC or multi-version concurrency control. And in order to do that, it needs to take snapshots frequently. A snapshot is basically a compact record of which transactions are still running or have not yet started and which transactions are already complete. Because these snapshots are taken frequently, it can lead to performance problems. In particular, in existing releases, it sometimes scales poorly when the number of active connections is very large and especially on systems which have many CPU cores. The implementation has been significantly rewritten in PostgreSQL 14 and the scalability is considerably improved. The result is that when you have a database server with a, a large number of active connections, the performance drop-off that you see as you increase the connection count to something very, very large is considerably less than it was before. I don't believe it's practical to ever support an arbitrarily large number of connections without any performance drop-off, but this can really help with the, the level of degradation that you see. The second performance improvement that I'd like to highlight is called bottom-up index deletion. PostgreSQL, because it uses MVCC, has to retain old versions of rows that have been updated or deleted until those old versions are no longer of interest to any running transaction. When they're not cleaned up fast enough, the table or index can become larger, even though from the user perspective, the amount of data that's being stored has not increased. To try to help with the problem of index bloat specifically, B-tree indexes in version 14 have this new opportunistic cleanup strategy, which is called bottom-up index deletion. An example of where this may be helpful is, imagine that you have a table of people and you have an index on the birth date column. The birth date column isn't likely to be frequently updated because generally speaking, people's birth dates don't change. However, you might be updating other columns in the table quite frequently. In this kind of situation, in previous releases, you might have seen the index on the birth date column grow over time as the table is subjected to a large number of updates. The size of that uh, index should grow much less or not at all in PostgreSQL 14 and in Advanced Server 14 as a result of this improvement. Finally, uh, I'd like to tell you, oh, not finally. Next, I'd like to tell you about partition pruning. In existing releases, partition pruning primarily works for select queries. It doesn't work very well for update and delete queries. In version 14, that's been corrected. That means that if you update, update, that if you issue update or delete queries against a partition table and they target a single partition, they should now be planned and executed considerably more efficiently than they were in earlier releases. Now, finally, I'm going to tell you about an improvement to logical replication. There are actually quite a number of improvements to logical replication in this release, but I'd like to highlight just one, which is the ability to stream transactions to subscribers while those transactions are still in progress. The advantage of this is that it can improve latency for large transactions. Uh, this doesn't completely solve the problem. Imagine, for example, that you do a large bulk load into the database. The insert statements that are part of that bulk load can't be applied on the subscriber until after the bulk load has been committed. That was true in previous releases, and it will still be true in version 14. The difference, however, is that all of the data that's going to need to be inserted can now be transmitted from the publisher side to the subscriber side while the inserts are still going on. You'll still have to wait for the transaction to be applied on the subscriber side after it commits on the origin node, 
but at least you won't also have to wait for the data to be transferred at that point in time. That's the end of my presentation. So now I'll just address a couple of questions which uh, came up in the course of the discussion or the presentation rather, and any others that people may want to add as we move along. One of the questions that was asked is, when will uh, Advanced Server 14 for Linux become available in the EDB repositories? The answer to that question is that we're currently planning for December, but plans are subject to change. And uh, I'm not uh, in a position to give you the final word on that subject, but at this point we are aiming for December. Uh, regarding the uh, question of whether there is a trial with BDR or whether the licensing still requires a purchase from EDB, um, I think that I'm not the right person to answer that question. Uh, I do know that it is an EDB product and that to use it, you would need a license, but I don't know off the top of my head whether there is a trial period. Um, so that's a question that you might want to uh, talk to someone in sales about because I, I unfortunately am not able to answer it uh, completely. Um, there's a question about whether I'm related to another Haas. Uh, I'm not related to that particular person. Uh, I do have relatives, but not that one. Um, there's also a question uh, about whether PostgreSQL uh, 14 uh, advanced server enhancement with BDR will be pushed out or ported to the PostgreSQL 14 BDR code. Um, I think that there may be a, a little bit of a, a confusion about exactly what's going on here. Uh, you know, PostgreSQL 14 is not an EDB product. That's a community project. So we don't have any control over their source code. Uh, we can't we can't just put things uh, into that source code. In fact, no one can put things into PostgreSQL 14 at this point because that branch has already been released. The community considers it a stable branch um, and no more changes uh, will be included in there except for security and bug fixes. In terms of the possibility of including uh, some of this technology in future releases of PostgreSQL, uh, we are often working to take changes that we have developed for BDR um, and move them into PostgreSQL, but I don't know the exact status of those efforts or whether any particular enhancement that we talked about today is on the list of things that uh, people are planning to move to there. Again, I'm not the BDR expert. I'm here uh, you know, to talk about PostgreSQL and to talk about advanced server. So uh, one of the BDR guys might be able to tell you about the plans in more detail than I can. Uh, or perhaps you know someone in product management, but I can't uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what the plans that are going on there. Uh, there is a question about uh, encryption at rest in PostgreSQL 14 or Advanced Server 14. Um, that is uh, not a feature of the product. Uh, EDB does have some partnerships uh, that can help with those kinds of requirements, uh, which again I'm not the right person to comment on, but there are some options available. Uh, if uh, you'd like to reach out to your sales representative. Um, there's a question about whether in auditing, multiple insert, update, or delete groups can be specified. Uh, yes, that does work. Okay. Uh, and I think that's all of the questions. Uh, do we have compression in PostgreSQL 14? Uh, that's a really interesting question. PostgreSQL has had a limited form of compression for years. Um, we don't compress data blocks, but we do compress individual values if those values are larger than typically about two kilobytes. In previous releases of PostgreSQL, that compression was done using uh, an, an algorithm internal to PostgreSQL, was, which was written by one of the early PostgreSQL hackers many years ago. In PostgreSQL 14, we now have another option, which is to use LZ4 which is a state-of-the-art compressor written by a compression expert uh, rather than using the PGLZ algorithm. Uh, it's quite a bit faster and it also compresses the data better. So I don't know if that's exactly the kind of compression that you're looking for, um, but it is a compression improvement which is present in version 14 uh, and I did some work on it, so I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I think that covers all of the questions that are, oh, um, will BART still be able to back up version 14? Uh, I believe the answer to that question is no. I think we are uh, encouraging customers to migrate to Barman or PG Backrest, um, and BART will not be available for server version 14. Um, there's a question about whether the Zheap extension works with advanced server. Um, I'm not aware that there is a production quality version of Zheap. 
uh, or that it's available as an extension rather than a set of core patches. Uh, so I think the answer to that question is no. Um, I think I've now hit all of the Q and A's. Um, and then over in the chat, uh, there was there was a question about uh, whether there are any plans to change po the Postgres architecture from process based to thread based. Um, I think uh, it depends on what you mean by plans. Uh, it's definitely something that I've spent uh, time talking about with uh, other uh, PostgreSQL hackers. And I think it's something which uh, a number of the senior hackers believe would be a really good thing to do. Uh, it is a very large and complex project and I don't know that anyone is actively working on it right now. And I certainly don't think that there's any kind of ETA for that work to get done, but I do think that there's interest. Um, anytime soon, are we planning to have columnar support? That's a great question. Um, I don't believe so. I think um, there is a new table access method interface that was added a couple of years ago uh, to PostgreSQL, which was intended to enable various other kinds of storage besides the heap storage, which is part of PostgreSQL uh, today. The first production quality user of that uh, API has yet to show up. And columnar storage would be a particularly difficult place to start because columnar storage would require uh, not only using that API, but probably also changing around significant parts of PostgreSQL's planner and executor in order to get the kinds of performance that people would be expecting. Uh, so there are some limited things available that can be used like the Citus, uh, Citus FDW, I believe it's called. Um, but uh, the capabilities that PostgreSQL has in that area today are pretty, pretty limited, not really anything in core and the, the range of extensions that are available uh, are still, I would say, a, a bit on the primitive side. Uh, there's a question here about whether the community is considering to continue with MVCC architecture. Um, I think everyone has pretty much decided that MVCC is the winner. Uh, the alternative that used to be used by some database products was uh, two-phase locking, um, which has terrible concurrency properties. It's much better for bloat because it doesn't end up storing multiple copies of data in the same way, but you really pay for it because read transactions that are just doing a select can block write transactions that are trying to update data and write transactions that are updating data can block read transactions that are only trying to select data. That can be extremely, extremely painful. So, you know, uh, Oracle moved to uh, MVCC many years ago. Many of the other major database products now have either moved to MVCC or e have it as an optional model. Uh, and I expect that trend to continue. Of course, there's always work to be done to improve the quality of the MVCC implementation and cut down on the problems that people experience when they try to use it. And certainly, bloat is high on that list of problems. But I think that pretty much every database vendor agrees that the alternatives are worse at this point. Okay. Um, and I think I've now hit all of the questions. Yep, I think you got them all. Um, okay, so if we don't have anything come up in the next um, minute or so, I just wanted to thank you, Robert, for such a great presentation and everyone else for attending. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be following up with the recording and the slides. So keep an eye out for that. And since I don't see anything coming through, I think that's it. Thank you so much and have a uh, wonderful day. Thank you.